Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to Read Becca for my chatty weekly catch up on everything that I read, everything I'm currently reading, and everything I'm looking forward to reading for about the mid-January period. Uh, I, I have definitely still been on a slowdown in my reading, so I did finish a couple of things, but it has been markedly slower this month than last month. I don't know why that is. I think the cold is probably getting to me, which we'll come back to in the lifey section. But let's begin with the books. Uh, first, I read How High We Go in the Dark by Saigoya Nagamatsu, and uh, I listened to it on audio. There are a whole cast of narrators, quite, quite a few, many of them big names, and the audio narration was fantastic. This is a weird book because it's kind of, it's a mosaic novel where it's told in a sequence of short stories, but they do certainly all interconnect in at least a loose way, and they are all very clearly set in the same world. So this is a near future sci-fi where things have gone wrong. There's been some sort of pandemic, but much like our world, they're, they're facing multiple problems. So they're in the backdrop is also political conflicts going on. There is also climate change. Um, they're facing AI and singularity. So all of those are, are woven in. And I think that feels true to me to, you know, what we're dealing with. You don't just have one problem, but for me, for my liking, I feel like this was maybe, I think this is the author's debut. I think this was maybe a case of needing an edit down and being more selective about what's included in a collection to make it more cohesive. For me, if we had stuck completely with the theme of the pandemic aspects, like that would have been a much stronger book. There were two or three stories here that diverged from that in very much the plot focusing some other thing. Like there is one story that takes place completely on a spaceship going like a generation ship type setup. And there is, there's another one that's much more about singularity and the idea of that. And so I felt like those pulled me away from the topics that we had been previously exploring. They felt like realism and good world building that those topics were present, but I just didn't want them to be the focus of the story because it felt like shifting gears. <laughs> but overall, it was a great collection um, in terms of like the stories interconnecting and really building upon each other for the most part. I think we got so many mundane lives of people and that's something I really enjoy in short story collections. So we are seeing these major things, major emotional topics explored through really day-to-day -day workers' lives. Um, so we have early on a, a story about an amusement park for children who are, who are terminally ill because of this pandemic, and they go to a euthanasia theme park. And obviously that's completely gut-wrenching and heartbreaking, and um, I didn't cry. I know everybody suddenly cried, but I, I didn't. I didn't connect with that one even as much as some of the others that really did emotionally move me. But we're, we're following that story from the day-to-day -day life of someone who is working at the amusement park as they get connected with um, a, a woman and child who are there still with some hope that they're going to be able to get an experimental treatment and, and make it out of there. And as things slowly degrade and, and we watch this worker go about day-to-day -day happenings of having to say goodbye and make it the best experience for the people there, um, yeah, so we're going about the things like that. We have another story that's about these these robotic pets that people cling to so much. And it, he's a maintenance worker who's trying to keep these up and keep hope alive for people as they want to hang on to these pets that sort of have memories attached to them. So it's all of those very mundane details that I appreciated so much and made it feel so tangible and real. So I enjoyed this a lot. Um, it, it didn't blow me out of the water though, like I was expecting. I was kind of expecting this to have a real emotional gut punch and it did at, at points, but not quite as much as I expected. Um, it is tackling some difficult topics and, and at many times over the stories, it does feel like, you know, he just chose the things that are going to really hit you hard as the reader. But I don't feel that it, it came across as overly emotionally manipulative. It also is really, interesting to see that the topics that are being explored here are so much about grief and loss and how we adapt to major change, how it becomes a new norm. Um, because we're talking about so many morbid topics and the fact that uh, loss has become such a major part of every day, 
that people internalize that and start establishing a new norm. And having been through 2020 and 2021 and the, the major occurrences to do with pandemic that happened there, we did see ourselves establish those new norms and slide things under the rug, you know, as far as the major things that were happening, deal with not knowing how to grieve when we were all not able to go to funerals or you know, having funerals over Zoom and the absurdity of those sorts of things. But yet those are what we lived through. And this feels like it's engaging with that by throwing some really absurd sounding things that are pretty practical ways of dealing with the absurd situation that they're in. So I, I did love that, that way that he imagined these absurdities and juxtaposed them against how absurd reality is. So I think it was really inventive. And this was my last book for the Ursula K. Le Guin Prize nominees of 2022. And I think it did very much live up to the goal of that prize, looking for truly imaginative fiction. This was a great, great selection for that. So uh, that I think, I think that's it for How High We Go in the Dark. Again, enjoyed it very much. And I do, I do very much recommend it if you can handle a real emotional gut punch of a read. Um, then I read John Wyndham's the Day of the Triffids, which this is like a terrible cover other than this little plant. I, I like the little plant, but I wish the cover were better. Um, so I'll put up a better cover here. This was an odd book because it's a proto example of another sort of pandemic novel, but this has multiple things going on. It's like disaster novel, pandemic novel, um, apocalyptic. It's a, a lot of things going on. And it being a proto example of that, I feel like I got a lot out of reading it, but I didn't enjoy it too much. Um, and it reminded me a ton of Blindness by Jose Saramago. I read, I think in 2022, so, so relatively recently. And in that story, everyone is going blind as a result of, of a virus of some sort. It's spreading. And here we have people going blind overnight. Basically, there's a comet that happens at the beginning and everyone wakes up blind, except our, our main character was in the hospital with his eyes covered. And he, he wakes up and he's able to see but everything is so quiet and weird. He doesn't know what's going on. And so he, he figures out, of course, it, quite quickly that in fact, there, there was this comet and everyone went blind. It takes them oddly long to kind of put two and two together <laughs> that they're related. Um, and I don't feel like we got a lot of answers about, about why everyone went blind. We do finally get some sort of assumptions toward the end of the book. And maybe that was the first problem that I had with this is that it feels like you could read about the first 20 pages and about the last 30 pages of this book and get all of the real content to it. The whole middle is scavenging and trying to survive. And that feels very done at this point, where I think we have all read that sort of book over and over and over now, because it, this was sort of innovated many years ago. And books like The Day of the Triffids really inspired people to write these kind of novels more and more. So I, I don't feel like I saw anything new or useful there. There's also a very strong lack of character building in this book. So I had a hard time getting behind our character. Our, our main character is Bill. And that is about all you need to know about Bill. <laughs> there's no development or growth as a character. Um, there's very minimal characterization. Uh, I we don't really care what he was doing before. It just was not important. So most of this is just him scavenging around. and. We see the kind of standard now tropes of that, of running into groups and those groups being either good or bad and winding up splitting off. Um, the huge part of him, him scavenging, the drive that is meant to be what we buy into, is that he's spending all this time looking for a woman who he basically had just met when things get go wrong um, or right after things go wrong. He, he meets her and they kind of meet up with a group and, and then get, get separated. And I feel like, again, I've seen that so many times and this is not doing anything new or fresh with that. So reading 130 probably pages that is just that wasn't inspiring to me. You know, I think that arc has happened probably half a dozen times in The Walking Dead. <laughs> I'm seeing it done. So this was a hard one to really objectively look at because of that, because this has inspired so many things down the road uh, that now are kind of incorporated in genre norms. So I did enjoy it for having experienced an early example. Um, the ending part was probably my favorite bit because we, we finally get some stuff about triffids. That's, that's probably the most frustrating part is we hear so little about triffids over this whole book. It's supposed to be the day of the triffids. But for, again, that whole bulk of the book, 
you're sort of occasionally encountering them and having minor skirmishes or basically just going, oh no, there's Triffids over there, we better avoid them. And that's it. That's like the encounters with the, the Triffids and that. You don't really get a background or what's, what's going on really. Um, I liked a lot of what was in the background world building at the beginning and end though. So there were bright spots to this. Um, the bright spots to this are kind of the themes that this was engaging with and I wish it had gone even further on those. So uh, the first three chapters that I think are the useful to read are introducing us to Bill and his waking up in the hospital and then chapter two we jump backwards and see what has led up to this. So in chapter two we are hearing about basically factory farming of triffids. Um, the triffids start showing up around the world and someone quickly realizes that they create this oil or, or they can be have oil harvested from them and that it's very useful and valuable and a corporate uh, group take over doing all of that, push out competitors who are providing other products that would be used for the same thing. Um, and so there is a really great like corporatism story there that just gets completely dropped at the beginning. So I, I wanted to, you know, understand more background of that. And I think that is something that has played into a lot of storytelling in modern times. Um, and then toward the end, as we're getting a little bit more of the Triffids, you know, we start to, to see kind of that dynamic of colonialism and the overtaking of the world by, by men. So that dynamic of, of man versus nature is certainly there. And very lightly at the end, I know this is a big theme through Wyndham's works from what I've heard, is fascism. So we are certainly seeing a, other groups rising up and kind of taking a overriding control of, of areas and demanding that people adhere to what they want and there's no there's no choice and so we see that creep in but it doesn't really go too much of anywhere so from the, the little bit of the book that actually had content to it for me uh, i did see very very strong themes of being post-war and dealing with changes and what everyone has had to sacrifice and give up and how there is no going back um, eventually Bill does find the woman he was looking for and they, they do kind of start their, their own small little society and they cre create a new norm. And in that, they're thinking back and thinking about all the things their children will miss out on. And I think that was the most gripping part for me, the, the most meaningful thing that I'm going to take away from this was them looking back on all, all the changes to the world and how there is no going back. There's no reverting to what was a norm for them. And I think that was the powerful message of this. Um, there's, there's also like heavy duty sexism to this story that I struggled with. Um, reading anything of this time is of course going to have some of that, but like they immediately go to the ideas of creating almost a reproductive dystopia where the first group that, that he meets up with are really gung-ho on, on collecting women and the fact that they need to reproduce right away. And this just frustrated me immediately because they're in a situation where they're about to be on limited resources. Why would you want to immediately start pumping out babies and have, have all of your women who can work, who can see, um, have them focused on like using those resources to create a baby and child rearing um, <laughs> instead of having them also help to stabilize what you've got. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> So I never, I never can buy into that in the, in these sort of apocalyptic stories uh, where like they immediately go to, well, we need to save mankind by reproducing. Well, if, if people are just living their lives, they will keep reproducing <laughs> for the most part. Um, yeah, you don't need to artificially force that to happen. So that I didn't love. I also, on the other hand, saw so many subtle references to the women having something to offer that the men, or specifically Bill, does not. They're so much more observant about things. There are many times when Bill is just going about his day, doing manly things, and the women are really noticing a lot of what's going on and changes in behaviors or their surroundings, and Bill is unobservant <laughs> completely. And they are so much more capable than everyone else is giving them credit for, or the men, I guess, are giving them credit for. And I don't know if that is meant to be a subversion or if that's unintentional. Um, we also do see like, so the handling of blindness throughout this is pretty bad. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's a spoiler because it's like right away immediately, but be aware going in that 
in the first few scenes, people are taking their own lives because they're blind. And for me, I didn't buy into that at all, number one, uh, because I think people would at least wait and see, well, are they going to come up with some sort of cure? But people immediately are just offing themselves. It's ridiculous. And not only is that very ridiculous, unsensitive, and pretty darn ableist, I was prepared to, you know, suspend my disbelief and be like, okay, John Wyndham has, has never met a blind person. We'll, we'll fantasize this world as one where blind people just don't exist. But then blind people really do exist. And um, because we want to retain all the women, they, they bring in uh, blind women to teach the women who are, or previously blind women, to teach the women who are newly blind how to just go about their day. And hey, we could have done that with everyone, not just the women, is never acknowledged at any point. <laughs> it's like, okay, we could have probably reestablished a functioning society by just turning to the people who were already blind and saying, hey, show us how to get by, and it would have all been pretty okay. Um, yeah, so that, that was just whoosh, I don't know. Um, I wish that had been handled with a lot more nuance and grace. Um, it was not handled worse than blindness by, by Saramago that I referenced earlier, because in, in that story, everything goes to hell. And it is horrible and unrelentingly bleak there. Here, it is bleak, but it's not unrelentingly so. I think this was bleak, but also entertaining. And so I think Blindness is a way better book, but this was more entertaining and I enjoyed reading it more, except it was a slog through the whole middle and I desperately wanted much more Triffid. <laughs> so it was in a mixed bag. It's kind of middle of the road. Again, because this is an early example of something, I really appreciate having read it and having that grounding in my, you know, science fiction roots, but I didn't love the book as a book. It wasn't super enjoyable to read either because of all this ridiculous and dark content. So, so it's a mixed bag. I think that's it. I have way rambled about these two. This is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so quickly, we're in a rambly mood today, so I won't talk about these, but I started The Uncommon Reader by Ellen Bennett and I'm working on As We Are Now by Mae Sarton. So we're continuing Octogenary Annuary, I guess, <laughs> on my old lady books. I'm very much enjoying those. In audio, I'm progressing my first, my January pick for nonfiction spontaneity, The Secret History of Food by Matt Siegel. So that is everything I'm reading. In watching stuff, I don't think there's anything terribly specific I wanted to talk about that I finished this week, but I have been progressing in some very old seasons of reality shows and kind of randomly had a moment of, of introspection and discovery myself, or reflection, I guess because I was watching the season six of Top Chef recently was added to Netflix and it's from 2010, I think 2009 maybe. And I had also recently been watching the very early seasons of Survivor, like the first couple of seasons. And it is so fascinating looking back at those shows and seeing how far we've come. Um, Survivor I watched a little while ago, um, but whatever season it was with Boston Rob, there was someone on the season that was gay and Boston Rob kind of was not overtly like homophobic about this person, but aggressively did try to out this person. And as far as I know, after the fact, he did apologize about that. But it is it is really weird to see the, the treatment and handling of that. There was something similar in the previous season before that as well. And like, you would not see that now, I don't think, um, or anything like that. And to the same vein, the season of Top Chef what, and what got me started thinking about it is that they were catering a um, bachelorette and bachelor party. And one of the, the people competing was very upset about this due to the fact that I think three of them were, were all gay and were would not be able to get married legally. And so, you know, they were very vocal about that in this competition and, and talking about that, how, how frustrating and emotional that was for them. And so you know, obviously we have come past that and it's hard to, or I guess it's easy to lose sight of that progress that we've made and seeing that so overt and so directly and emotionally impacting people in these old reality shows that are not really that old. Like this isn't even the nineties. We're talking 2009, 2010, having someone on a show, not being able to get married and really feeling the oppression of that, even though it's, it's not directly, directly impacting them in that moment. It's this very throwaway thing for the competition show. So yeah, I, it was making me feel 
a lot of political hope and that that's in short supply I think and so I loved I loved seeing that and being able to reflect on that anyway dumb reality show <laughs> ramble over uh so what else life stuff so obviously the big thing is hair um that's probably very noticeable because I dyed and trimmed my hair I have been needing to trim it for a while and since 2020 I have not dyed or really significantly cut my hair but before that before I was on booktube I always had short or dyed hair. Pretty much chin length is about the longest my hair ever got. So this is already very, very long and it was quite a bit longer before I trimmed it, but I'm not thrilled <laughs> with the dye. Um, it did not turn out at all like I wanted. So um, I, don't, I don't hate it. It's not terrible or anything. It's fine. Um, I wanted to try not bleaching and doing over-the-counter box dyes from the store and I got two that, that looked like they would be great and they didn't, they didn't really turn out <laughs> as I wanted. Uh, but this is fine. It will probably last six or eight weeks and then I will try again. I, I want to try with the professional dyes I usually used to use and we'll see how those work without bleaching. But if at that point they, they don't have the desired effect, I'll just bleach and, and redo it. But it's fine. I'm okay with it. The only problem is this color, this reddish, I think makes me look much more pale <laughs> than I already am. So that's not helping me at all. Um, but but I'm, I'm fine with it and I definitely needed a trim. So the trim really, really helped. Um, I also, this week, because of the cold, was very frustrated. Um, I am much luckier than many others. I've seen multiple people who've really had severe impacts to their their housing um, because of the weather. The Arctic blast very much hit my area and everyone I know had weird problems because of it. And I live in an area that, that's pretty good about cold weather. Like we, we do typically get below zero uh, Fahrenheit routinely but not for very prolonged periods or quite to the level I think that that we did this time um so I think I talked about that last last week the lowest I believe we got was like negative 35 Fahrenheit with the wind chill um so it wasn't that was not the actual temp I think the actual temp was like negative 15 but it has just been so sustained very cold below freezing and those certain couple days of extremes really I don't know, knocked everybody out because I had weird, weird stuff happen where my, my dryer vent completely iced up on the interior, not the exterior. Um, I've never had that happen before. So I was concerned about like running the dryer if that was going to damage it or anything. My microwave, I believe has died, unfortunately. Um, I didn't even know, but my, my microwave is an over range microwave and it has the vent for the range um, behind it and that was letting in cold air uh, sufficiently. I've never had a problem with this before, but, but sufficiently enough cold air that the entire back of the microwave was covered in ice. I, I didn't know, I can't see it. It's, it's backed up against the wall and it's kind of surrounded in an encasing. And uh, I ran it one day while it was very, very cold and didn't realize. And when it was finished, there was just a big puddle in the microwave. And so I was like, oh my, what, what is going on there? And then took took out the grill and everything and looked in the back and it was just pure ice, just a layer of ice back there. So we didn't run it for days and then finally things warmed up. We got one day above freezing, so it warmed up enough and I, I checked back there and it was dry. <laughs> I tried running the microwave and it didn't heat anything. So I think my microwave unfortunately is dead, which is not ideal. That It really got to me for sure and I obviously... I'm fine. It's not a huge thing for me, but it's unexpected. And after everything that I've been doing to, to redo the house, like I just did the floor, I'm doing the kitchen. And I thought that the microwave and a range, my oven were going to be the only things I didn't have to touch. And so now to have to deal with that and it's a microwave is not like an exorbitant, exorbitant expense, but it is a couple hundred dollars for an over range microwave. So like just so frustrating to have that unexpected thing come up and be like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to deal with this. <laughs> and I, I probably could get just a, a cheaper one, but even that, just like the small ones that you get for a countertop are like 50 bucks. So I may as well just hold off and get a new good one put in. And that's an, another headache. So I probably will just be living without a microwave for a little while until I feel like dealing with that. Um, I do wanna try resetting, like turning off the power to it because I can't get back there to turn it off manually or anything real easily. So I think I'm going to wait until I can do the breaker. I did try all of the breakers in the kitchen and weirdly it's not on any of the regular kitchen breakers, but it looks like someone very questionably wrote in microwave on the furnace one. 
So I'm thinking it's that, but I do not want to try anything that's going to shut off my furnace. <laughs> I'm not going to risk it until after we're out of this cold snap, which should be soon, hopefully. So I think overnight tonight, we're supposed to continue warming up and get over freezing tomorrow, finally, and then have rain. So I think tonight we're going to get some freezing rain or maybe snowy mix and then just rain solid for the next several days and it will be just above freezing. So that is going to be a great reprieve after I think two weeks almost of most of the time being below freezing. <laughs> so um, yeah, I've rambled on, I think way too much. I think that's it for me today. Um, I do have a recommendation. So I'm finally getting through all of the best ofs. Everything I had been watching was pretty much people's end of year stuff. So now that I'm through that, I'm on to some stuff I can actually recommend as you know, being outliers. Uh, number one, I had The Poptimist uh, did a wonderful list of Korean American fiction from 2023 that's really thorough, like dozens of works to go check out. And he's great at getting across the point of a book with a lot of brevity. So massive list to go check out. And then the other one is a shorter list, a list of five things from Melinda at Web of Stories about like not books, but bookish enhancements to your reading life. It's almost like a, a gratitude video because it's a list of some items that, that I might look into as interesting and, and other things that are not items, but generally things that really improve the reading experience rather than just books. And I really enjoyed that. So I think that's it for me today. Thank you all so very much for watching.